Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special Earth Optimism webinar, Conservation Success of the Black-Footed Ferret. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm gonna be your host for today. I'm really excited for today's program. We have some really awesome guests to introduce who are gonna share a little bit of their work, saving species in the American Great Plains. While we wait for a few more friends to join, I'm going to launch a quick poll. I wanna hear from you. What do you love doing in nature? You can select hiking, water activities, taking pictures, listening to wildlife, stargazing, or climbing trees. Uh, feel free to also pop those answers in the chat as well. While you take a minute to submit your answers, I will go over the format of today's webinar. So this webinar is live captioned. You'll wanna locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen. And as you can see, we also have American Sign Language interpretation today. If you have any issues uh, seeing the interpreter, please message our team and we will try to assist you with that. Today's program will be about 40 minutes, broken into two separate parts with an additional 15 minutes at the end to answer as many questions as we can. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you, but we do want to engage with you in a number of ways. As you saw, we are using the polls, which let's close this poll and see what you all love to do about in nature. Uh, amazing. So lots of hikers, tons of water activities. I also love swimming and kayaking, taking pictures, listening to wildlife. Wow, you all love so much. That's incredible. Um, in addition to the polls, you will see that that Q&A is open. So please drop in your questions at any time. We do ask that you try to keep your questions on topic and only ask them once. We promise we see them come in. Uh, we do have quite a few educators working behind the scenes to answer those questions. Uh, you'll wanna check that column for my questions. Maybe an educator has already answered. And lastly, you'll see that that chat is open as well. I see so many of you um, putting some comments in the chat too. Now I want you to find that chat box and I want you to tell me where you are tuning in from and how you are celebrating Earth Day today. Let's see. Asher, I know they're so cute. Mary Lou is tuning in from home, that's great. Um, I shout out to Miss Riley's third grade class from West Lawn Elementary School in Cedarsburg, Wisconsin. Shout out to Melissa and Emma joining from Idaho, Mary from Frederick. Um, Ellie, you have a nature journal. That's a great way to celebrate Earth Day. Um, oh, someone is right across from the zoo, Catherine. That's so cool. Um, Harley and Lillian say they're celebrating Earth Day by attending programs like this. What a great way to celebrate. Oh, someone's a field trip from Mexico. Wow. Oh, Allison, you made an Earth Day poster. How cool is that? Let's see what else. Pat, they're going to go weed. That's great. <laughs> Preparing for planting. Yes, yeah, some native pollinators, hopefully. Uh, uh, Mrs. Cottrell's uh, remote fifth grade class from New York. We have Mrs. Bernader's class from Bealesville Elementary. Mrs. Ann's first grade class from Pennsylvania. We have folks from Rockville, Maryland. And so many people are joining us today. Oh, Jarl, clean up on Earth Day. That's great. Uh, watching birds is such a great way to celebrate Earth Day. You all have so many great ideas for how you're going to celebrate. I love that. So I do want to introduce our first guests. They are joining us all the way from the Smithsonian's Conservation Biology Institute in Front Royal, Virginia. So welcome, Adrian and Vicki. And just a little map, you can see just how far um, that little red dot is where that Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute is. Um, and you can see where Washington DC is, where the National Zoo is. Hi, Adrian. Hello. Uh, do you wanna start by introducing yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Adrian uh, Crozier. I'm one of the curators here at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. 
Um, I've been here since 2005. I have a degree in reproductive physiology from North Carolina State University. And we are a very special facility out here um, in Front Royal, uh, kind of a sister facility to the zoo. That's so cool. So what sorts of animals do we have out there? We have lots of different species out here. We have lots of birds like Guam rails, uh, several different crane species, Micronesian kingfishers. We also have lots and lots of mammals. So we've got May wolves, cheetahs, red pandas, uh, lots of hoofstock species. Things like Kreswalski's horses, Dama gazelle, uh, Eld's deer. So lots of things you guys can look up online later and learn about. That's so, so cool. So we are here to talk about one species in particular. What is that today? We are here to talk about black-footed ferrets today. Great. And so I see Vicki has joined us. Hi, Vicki. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us where you are joining us from? Hi, my name is Vicki Lake. Um, I've been with the Smithsonian for about 12 years now, and this is my eighth year with the Blackfoot Ferrets. I have a degree in wildlife science from Virginia Tech. You're actually joining me here in what we call the small animal facility in Front Royal, Virginia. Um, we actually have 35 Blackfoot Ferrets here currently. We have 12 outdoor habitats that tend to get our juveniles because the lighting is better for them and more natural there. And then we have another 23 indoor habitats and two mobile habitats. Wow. So I just launched a poll that says, asking our viewers if they've ever heard of a black-footed ferret. So those results are coming in. It looks about like half of them have heard of a black-footed ferret. There's a good portion that have never heard of a black-footed ferret. So I'm so excited to uh, talk about them today. Now, Vicki, I noticed that you're wearing a mask and gloves. Is this because of COVID? Actually, it's not. We wear protective gear for black-footed ferrets. We wear our masks. We wear special coveralls that are only for in with the ferrets, gloves, and boots. This is because the ferrets are actually susceptible to so many diseases that we don't want to get them sick with. Unfortunately, this is a side effect of that um, genetic bottleneck that we'll discuss later. Great. So you are in the Blackfooted Ferret facility at Front Royal. Can you tell us a little bit about what is behind you? What are we looking at? Yeah, so we're looking at one of the ferret habitats here. Um, you can kind of see these guys are fossorial, so they usually live underground. So we have the natural soil that you can see. We also want to give them something called enrichment, things that are, are, are exciting for them or just give them a little bit of variety in life. Um, you can see they have some tubes that, are, that we bury that they can go into to mimic burrow systems. They have some novel items, like the, what we call it jolly ball, which is what the red ball is, uh, as well as some other fun things. The gray circle that you see is actually a repurposed trash can. We cut off the ends so that it mimics a tube and something that they can jump on and play on. Additionally, we have inside there, we have um, a flower pot that's turned upside down that we've repurposed to mimic tides for them. And then they can pop their little heads up the hole <laughs> to do a natural behavior called periscoping. In addition, the other thing that you can see inside is the green thing in there is what we call her nest box. Inside of that, you can see that now, but inside there we have this shredded paper stuff called alpha dry. It's a soft absorbent lint bedding material. That's where she primarily spends her time during the day. So you said this word fossorial, which means they primarily burrow or live underground. So all of those tubes, those enrichment tubes that you have are ways for them to still kind of practice being underground. And as you said, periscoping, oh, that's a great photo we have there. of One of those tubes, how they can go in and pop their heads out just like they would in the wild burrows. Very cool. Oh my goodness, all these photos, these are great. So I love, so the enrichment that you put in there is so that the black-footed ferrets can still exercise their natural behaviors just like they would out in the wild, right? Correct. I actually have um, one of our empty alpha dry bags that that bedding material comes in that we put shredded paper into that I'm going to place in there 
as something novel for her to do her natural behavior and investigate to try to, to determine what it is. That's so great. So enrichment is always so important to all of our animals here. And some of you might even give enrichment to your pets at home, uh, your dogs, you might give them Kong feeders or your cats might have some toys that they can bat around. All of that is considered enrichment. Human enrichment might be some puzzles. I like to do Sudoku or yoga. That is my physical and mental enrichment that helps exercise my brain and my body. So can you tell us a little bit more about the habitat that black-footed ferrets live in? And I'm gonna pull our audience and see where they think black ferrets come from. So let's see, do you think they're from North America, Asia, Europe, or Antarctica? Give a couple seconds for those answers to come in, but you're all getting it pretty close. That's great. All right, let's give you a couple more seconds to answer. And just so everybody watching knows, we uh, one of our uh, educators behind the scenes has dropped in a list of vocabulary, just in case we mention a, a term that you might not be familiar with. We have that in the chat for you. All right, I'm gonna close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see, all right. We see we had 56% said that they're from North America, followed by Asia, Europe, and a couple votes for Antarctica. Vicki, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about where black ferrets are, black-footed ferrets are from? So most of you actually are correct. You guys are from North America. They are from out west in the prairie land. They actually live in prairie dog burrows. That's actually their primary food source is the, the prairie dog. They're what we call an obligate carnivore. Therefore, 95% of their diet is made up of a single species, meaning the black footed ferret eats primarily prairie dog. They also live in the prairie dog burrows. Wow, that's really, really cool. So in the wild, they're eating mostly prairie dogs. What are you feeding them um, at SCBI? At SCBI, we have two different diets. So five days a week, they get what we call Toronto. It's a ground up meat product. It kind of looks like raw hamburger. And then two days a week, we actually feed them what we call whole carcass, meaning either a whole fawn rat, or sometimes we give them five rats so that they can practice their hunting skills. Wow, that's really, really cool. Um, so they're practicing these hunting skills, and we said you're putting that enrichment in there so that they can practice burrowing. Are black footed ferrets? nocturnal, meaning they're mostly awake at nighttime, or are they diurnal, meaning they're mostly awake during the day like we are? She thinks are actually, while she's out right now, normally they are actually active at nighttime, meaning they're nocturnal. Very, very cool. And I was wondering, um, Josh is behind the camera, if we can zoom in a little bit, I see her running around, if we can get a little bit closer view to see if her, her running around. Well, now what is this ferret's name? This is actually Rosebud, one of our um, two-year-old females here at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. She's a bounce around to investigate, sometimes roll around and play in the, what we call play in the um, credit paper. She's investigating, trying to see if there's anything fun or exciting or if there's any food, anything like that. Absolutely. Daniel said, ah, oh, Jennifer said, Victoria, there's a ferret behind you. <laughs> That's so great. I could watch them play around all day. Now, this is so cool that you get to be working with the black-footed ferrets. Um, we have a great question from um, Asher. Are black-footed ferrets endangered? Yes, actually, black-footed ferrets are currently endangered. Um, there's a, a, they're, they were thought extinct not once but twice, but luckily we got them back. Uh, but then unfortunately the numbers still are very low, so they still are considered in danger. Great. Now this, like I said, such a cool job to be working with such an endangered species. And this is a great species that we here love to highlight on Earth optimism because they actually have a very successful conservation story. Um, Adrian, can you tell us a little bit about 
how black-footed ferrets came to be endangered and why we are now caring for them at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Yes. So like Vicki mentioned, we actually thought the population of black-footed ferrets was extinct in the wild. Um, a small population was discovered in a place called Matitsi, Wyoming. Um, a dog named Shep actually found one of the black-footed ferrets out on farmland. And that happened in 1981. The population was closely monitored, but after about 1984, it was noted that it was starting to decline quite a bit. So the last of the wild individuals that they could find out there in Wyoming were brought into zoos to help them reproduce. And then a reintroduction program was started to put the animals back into the wild in 1991. Wow, so just to reiterate, so there were only 18 individual black-footed ferrets found in the wild, and we've now brought them into zoos to breed them and then reintroduce them into the wild. What caused their numbers to decrease so much? So a couple different things actually led to that. So one big one was um, habitat loss. So a lot of their native uh, homeland out there on the prairie was being converted into farmland. And in addition to that, there was a loss of their food source. Like Vicki mentioned, their primary food source out in the wild are prairie dogs. And when that conversion to farmland happened, a lot of the prairie dogs were lost and killed. Um, and then the second thing that happened with the ferrets was that they're really susceptible to disease. So they do have that lack of gene diversity and they're really susceptible to lots of different um, diseases, things like canine distemper and also sylvatic plague. Wow. So both of those terms, canine distemper and sylvatic plague, are both on that vocab sheet that will be dropped in that chat again for those joining. Wow. So um, Vicki, back to you. So all of those ferrets that we brought into zoos and um, institutions like the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, um, when they're in here, this is where we're caring for them and breeding for them. So what does the, that process look like? Yeah, so these guys are what we call seasonal breeders, um, meaning they're not ready to breed throughout the year. They have a, a time frame. So usually starting in January, February, the males will start to come into season. And then starting around um, March to April, the females will start to come into season. And then we can decide who to pair with who uh, based on genetics for what's best uh, for the population. Then after the female is bred, um, their gestation is 42 days, wow. which we you guys don't make it easy on us. They go through something called a pseudo pregnancy sometimes. So we just have to spend that 42 days hoping that she has babies. If she does have the babies, they're born really tiny. They're about the size of your pinky, um, but they grow really, really fast. Oh, there's a great photo of what baby black-footed ferrets look like. How many do they have at one time? The average litter size is four what we call kits. Four kits at one time average. Wow, that's really cool. So once um, a female gives birth to the kids, how, what happens before they go and be reintroduced into the wild? Yeah, so what happens is they'll start, they stay here with their mom. Um, we start introducing that live prey that we mentioned around 50 days of age for the kids. So they can start to see mom get a little bit of the hunting skill practices. They'll get, they'll go through um, a couple of exams where they get shot against the canine distemper and the rabies, as well as individual markers called, um, they get a pit tag or a passive integrated transponder tag. Looks like a little grain of rice um, so that we can identify each individual. Because that little grain of rice, when we take a reader and pass over, it gives you a unique number so that we know who the individual is. Then once they uh, reach around 90 to 120 days, they will be caught up individually put into a crate like this with some shredded paper and one of those little black tubes for them to hide in. And then they make a trip all the way out to a place called Carr, Colorado, where they'll go through something called boot camp. They have to get practice living in actual bur burrows from prairie dogs, as well as being introduced to the actual food source, the prairie dogs. They have to 
graduate from boot camp <laughs> before and be able to introduce to a live black or live prairie dog before they graduate and are able to be released. Wow. So it sounds like we kind of test them before we want to make sure that they can care for themselves and fend for themselves before being released back to the wild. That's really, really neat. And we have some great questions in here. Um, Adrian, can you give us an estimate? We've, as we mentioned, we brought all these black footed ferrets into the zoos to breed them and are reintroducing them. We went from 18. How many are in the wild about today? Today, there are just under 400 individuals living out in the wild, and there's actually 30 different release sites. Some are more active than others, um, but there are quite a few release sites out west in their natural habitat. Wow. So we went from 18 to over 400. That's really, really great. Um, there was another question in here about what their biggest environmental threat today. Adrian, can you repeat what that was? So the loss of the prairie dogs was certainly um, a big threat to the ferrets, as well as just loss of their, their native habitat. Um, and then again, the diseases that they're so susceptible to. So um, the sylvatic plague, which is uh, contracted by, um, through fleas, um, and then also the canine distemper. And so there's another great question here from Ellie about whether they get vaccinated to help fight against some of these diseases. Yes, we do vaccinate all of the ferrets that are born in our zoos. That's great. And Lily and Levi wanted to know if you can repeat just how many black-footed ferrets do we have at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute? Right now we have 35 and hopefully we'll have lots of babies born here in the next few months. Wow. I'm sorry, I'm getting so distracted by just watching this one run around and enjoy all of her enrichment. Um, so Tim asked how many kits they have in a year. So I think we said that they have an, on average four kits in one birth and they only breed once a year, correct? Yes. Great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about their social structure? Uh, Lauren wanted to know how they interact with each other. Do they live? socially or are they solitary, meaning they spend most time alone? These guys are actually solitary. Uh, they usually only come together, a male and a female will come together for breeding purposes and then a female raises the kits all by herself. Then once the kits usually reach around 120 days old, they'll start dispersing on their own and go off and create their, their own little living situation. They usually hang out by themselves. Wow, that's so great. Um, before we move on to our next segment, I do want to ask Gianna and Jaden asked, can you reiterate again why they live underground? Yeah, these guys primarily live underground. Um, that's a safe place for them to be uh, to avoid the predators. A lot of the predators such as coyotes and hawks and foxes are above ground as well as that's where their food source is. Um, they do a two for one combo meal, kind of. They, they eat the prairie dogs as well as they use their homes as their home. That's great. So those burrows underground are not only a great place to find food, but it's such a great place for them to hide from being food from those coyotes or those hawks. And what was that when you said fox? That's so wonderful. So it's such a great story. And again, this is why we love highlighting this conservation success story of the black-footed ferret. Because again, like we mentioned, we went from only 18 individuals in the wild to now over 400. And it's because of institutions um, like zoos and how important zoos are to saving species. That's so great. And um, I'm very excited because we are lucky enough to be joined by some uh, scientists who are actually right now living in the American Great Plains and studying the black-footed ferret um, habitats and ecosystems where black-footed ferrets used to live and in some places are being reintroduced. But before I invite them on, I'm gonna turn my camera off for just a second so we can get a little up-close view and see if we can watch this black-footed ferret run around for just a little bit.
that was great. I really could watch these animals all day. They're just so cute. All right. So again, just so happy to talk about the black-footed ferrets. I'm going to let Adrian and Vicky go for the moment. I'm sure they have some other animals that they need to feed today, but I hope that they'll be joining us at the very end of today's program to help answer some more of our questions from our Q&A. But for now, Vicky and Adrian, we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now at this time, I would love to welcome Dana and Andy onto the program. Hello, uh, why don't you start by introducing yourselves, Dana? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dana Nelson and I am a research fellow with the Smithsonian and I'm also a student working on my PhD with Clemson University. And I've been lucky to study mammals on the prairie in Wyoming and now in Montana. That's so great. Hi Andy. Hey everybody, my name is Andy Boyce. Uh, I'm a conservation ecologist with the Smithsonian's uh, Great Plains Science Program, and I live and work uh, out here in Montana. That's so great. So I'm sure you are listening, but we just learned all about how we breed black-footed ferrets out at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute as part of this wonderful reintroduction program into the wild. Now, Dana, you have some wonderful experience, and you actually used to work at one of these reintroduction sites. Can you tell us a little bit what happens once those black-footed ferrets are reintroduced to the wild? Sure thing, Shelly. It's really cool. Um, so when ferrets are released back into the wild after that boot camp that Vicki described, um, we mostly just want to monitor how they're doing. You know, we want to answer questions like, how many are there? How many survived? Um, how many babies are they having? And where are they choosing to live? So uh, we have to match their ecology, right? We have to go look for them. And we go out from sunset until sunrise, since they're nocturnal, looking for uh, black-footed ferrets on prairie dog towns. And wow. uh, you, you can see in these pictures here, we use some pretty uh, giant flashlights to do this, is essentially what we're doing. So you can hold a handheld spotlight and kind of scan across the prairie, or you can mount it to your pickup truck, and that helps us count them. And when we're lucky and we do see their gorgeous green eye shine, we can trap them, we can give them health checks and vaccines, and uh, just make sure that we've got a really good count on how they're doing. That's really, really cool. So you said you're shining a light out into the pitch black, right? Cause it's the middle of the night. And then you look for those little spots glowing. Sometimes if any viewers have any cats at home, sometimes in the middle of the night, you might see your cat's eyes too. That's really, really cool. So you're studying how they're interacting with their environment and some of those other animals. Now I know that we are going to be joined by another special um, researcher. If we have Andrew Dreeland as a Smithsonian Research Fellow who's joining us from the field in Montana, but we are gonna keep Andrew muted today just because I think it's very windy out there in Montana, but we'll see if we can get him um, up on the screen. Um, Andy, can you tell us a little bit about where Andrew will be joining us from? Yeah, of course. So he's coming to all of us live right now from the grasslands of central Montana. Um, he is living and working and studying grasslands uh, in a place called the American Prairie Reserve. Um, the American Prairie Reserve and the areas around it are one of the biggest chunks of native grassland left anywhere in North America. And it's really an amazing, amazing ecosystem. Um, and it's places like the American Prairie Reserve where we still have large colonies of prairie dogs, and in turn, we have the potential uh, to provide a home for animals with black footed ferrets. That's so great. I love that it's called um, Prairie Dog Town. Um, so are there, are there black footed ferrets at this site at the moment? So where you're, what you're seeing right now is, is Andrew, you can see his scope right there pointed yeah. out towards, towards a Prairie Dog Town. You can tell it's like a really, really flat area with really short grass. Uh, and you can see the burrows there. This particular prairie dog town does not currently have black-footed ferrets on it. Um, oh, that's awesome. I think we can actually see uh, a few prairie dogs out on the burrow there from, from Andrew's camera. Um, so because, because ferrets rely you know, completely on, on prairie dogs for their food, 
uh, and for a place to live, they require really, really large prairie dog towns um, in order to survive. So um, folks at the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the American Prairie Reserve are working really hard to conserve uh, black-tailed prairie dogs to provide large enough uh, prairie dog towns for black footed ferrets. This is, this is a place where we're still working on that. That's so great. So um, just to recap it, we learned just how important in the wild prairie dogs make up 95% of the diet for black footed ferrets. So obviously for our black footed ferrets to be successful in the wild, we need our prairie dogs to be successful as well. So can you tell us a little bit more about why prairie dogs are so important both to black footed ferrets as well as the entire ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as biologists, we use a couple different terms when we talk about prairie dogs. The first one is keystone species. So a keystone species is an animal that has a, what we call a, a disproportionate or just a really, really large effect on an ecosystem um, compared to say, you know, just the size of the animal. Uh, and prairie dogs are keystone species for temperate grassland ecosystems. Um, they, they provide quite a few services. You know, as we found out already, they're food for a lot of animals, not just black-footed ferrets, coyotes, uh, badgers, golden eagles, ferruginous hawks, all, all rely on prairie dogs for food. And, and beyond just being food for a lot of prairie animals, they also create habitat. So, so Andrew is walking us through a prairie dog town right now. And you can see that there's like some really uh, particular things about that habitat. The grass is really, really, really short because prairie dogs continually graze, mow that. Um, you can also see now that prairie dogs create, um, create burrows and anywhere where an animal is living full time, you also have poop. I think you saw a little bit of, of prairie dog poop there as well. Um, that provides food and habitat for a lot of really small animals like um, uh, insects, for example, which a lot of other species feed on. So just by going about their lives, they create habitat and food for a wide variety of prairie animals. I love that. Poop is just so important. We talk about it a lot here at the zoo and at SCBI. It tells us so much information and poop is a great way to track animals in the wild, right? Um, yes. <laughs> That's so one, so other, one other thing I just want to, I, I want to mention about prairie dogs is yeah. that we use the term keystone species, but there's another term we use specifically for prairie dogs and that's an ecosystem engineer. You know, human engineers build things, right? And, and we, call, we call prairie dogs ecosystem engineers because they literally construct the habitat just by going about their lives. So you can see again, all these different burrows that provide habitat, not just for black-footed ferrets, but for a variety of other organisms like spade-footed toads, snakes, burrowing owls. So they are, they are physically creating homes for many other species on the prairie. That's so great. So it sounds like these prairie dogs are not just so important for our uh, black-footed ferrets, but all of these other animals. And I actually have another poll that I'm gonna launch. Which of the following animals are also being conserved in the American prairie? we will give folks a second. Um, and this is, you can select all that apply. Um, we have bison, long-billed curlew, swift fox, and black-footed ferrets. Um, we're getting a lot of votes for black-footed ferrets as one can guess, since that's what our first half was about. Um, so I'm really excited to see what everybody has to say. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Meanwhile, Andrew, this is just a beautiful, beautiful shot. Uh, oh, it looks like we're going into a, one of these burrows. About how um, wide are the holes, Andy? Oh man, okay. Yeah, I think Andrew's giving us a, a, a great reference here. Yeah, they're about the size of your hand, um, but they do vary quite a bit. You know, each, each prairie dog creates holes and burrows that look a little bit different. Uh, it also depends on how long they've been living in that area. Some are these really huge mounds of dirt and others are just, you know, really small holes that you can barely see. So tons of variety. Very cool. So I'm going to end the poll here. And with this poll, all of the above, all of these animals are currently being conserved in the American prairie. And it's so important to conserve them in the American prairie. Dana, you are actually working on another reintroduction program of another species besides the black footed ferret. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're working on? I would love to. So similar to ferrets, there's another really cool prairie species that's being reintroduced um, up in that area, and that is the swift fox. 
So swift foxes, if you've never seen them before, they are a tiny canid, so a member of the dog family. In fact, they're so small, they only weigh five pounds, and they're smaller than most of our house cats. Um, these tiny foxes uh, love short grass prairie. Similar to ferrets, they spend a lot of time below ground because they live in dens. Um, and they also eat prairie dogs, but they do have a more diverse dinner plate. So swift foxes, unlike ferrets, will also eat a lot of mice, rabbits, and insects, things like that. That's really cool. And so how do you track and monitor the swift fox once they're reintroduced or before they're um, reintroduced? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, you know, when these foxes are being reintroduced to habitats that they used to live in, but don't live in anymore, it gives us an opportunity to learn about the reintroduction process as well as about the species themselves. So if you look at that picture pretty closely, one of the tools that we use to learn about reintroduction and about swift foxes are GPS collars. So it looks kind of like a little black necklace and it actually records everywhere that these foxes go. It record, tell, teaches us about how they move, where they live. Um, and this map here, for example, shows that these tiny house cat sized animals can really move. This individual, she was a female and she moved over a hundred miles in just one week. So it's pretty impressive. Yes, and we have another question just to reiterate, these are carnivores, right? These swift fox. They sure are. Yep. So most of their diet is made up of mammals even smaller than they are, followed by bugs like crickets and grasshoppers. And then occasionally they'll eat plant materials too. Very, very cool. And Andy, you are studying another one of those species that we are actively working to save in the American prairie. Um, what is it that you are studying out there? Yeah, thanks, Shelley. Um, I'm studying a bird called long-billed curlew. Um, long-billed curlews are actually shorebirds. Oh, and we have an awesome picture of them right here. You can see they're, it's really, really obvious how they get their name. They have this really long curved bill that they use for, to probe for food. And, you know, I think a lot of times we think of shorebirds naturally as being birds that live, you know, close to the ocean or in or swamps or wetlands or something like that. Um, but long-billed curlews actually migrate up to the northern Great Plains uh, to breed, to lay their eggs, uh, and to raise their young. So we talked about before how, how prairie dogs are keystone species, about how they have, a, have lots of effects on other, other members of the prairie community. And long-billed curlews are no example, or sorry, are no exception. Um, what we found out by placing these tiny little GPS backpacks that you see right here uh, in the photo is that long-billed curlews really, really prefer to forage to search for food and to build their nest close uh, to black-tailed prairie dog colonies, which is a really interesting finding. Um, and what we're working on now is by continuing to collect more and more data about their movements, we're trying to figure out exactly why they have that preference. Wow. Do you have any guesses as to why they, you think that they nest near prairie dog burrows? Yeah, yeah, we, we certainly do. So, you know, we talked, we talked before about how, um, you know, some of these prairie dog towns have thousands and thousands of prairie dogs, right? And all these animals are, are eating and pooping on the landscape. Um, and when they do that, they create food for a ton of insects. And long-billed curlews really, really like to eat large insects. So it's possible that areas around prairie dog towns have high abundances of food for long-billed curlews. So that's one possibility. Um, the other possibility has to do with, with security and safety from predators. So long-billed curlews, just like prairie dogs, um, can be, um, can be eaten by a variety of predators in the prairie. So ferruginous hawks, golden eagles, badgers. Um, you know, when you're living and you're building your nest way out far away from any other animals, you may not get a lot of warning if there's a predator coming towards you. But if you live inside of a prairie dog colony with thousands of prairie dogs constantly keeping watch for predators, you might get an early warning that a predator is approaching your nest. So that may provide a really important benefit to curlew. So Andrew, um, as part of his work, is going to be testing these ideas over the next couple of years. That's such a great thing to think about of how, again, interrelated all of these different species are and dependent on one another with the prairie dogs uh, making calls and they will might be warning the curlew of um, 
potential predators. Now, um, I have a lot of questions to ask you, but before we do, I do want to take a moment. I'm going to turn my camera off and let everybody just watch Andrew's camera and see what we can find. That's just so cool to see all of those burrows. And um, again, just all of those species. Um, so could we reiterate, Dana, do swift fox eat black-footed ferrets or primarily just other sources of meat like the prairie dogs and those other smaller rodents? Yeah, that's a good question. And I can tell you that 50% of their diet is smaller rodents, things smaller than they are typically um, prairie dogs, ground squirrels, mice, and even rabbits. That's really, really cool. Uh, let's see, what other great questions do we have? All right. Um, Noah wanted to know, um, it looks like there was a solar panel out there. Is that true? Maybe on the back of the truck. Maybe on the uh, maybe oh, on, on the, the Curlew's ba GPS backpack. Yes, that's exactly what it was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the the tiny little backpack. I think we had a we had a photo in the slideshow. Has a GPS inside and has a little modem so that it can send information to us about where where the curlews are. And the really really important thing is that it also has a solar panel so that this tag can continue to tell us where these curlews are traveling all over North America. United States, Canada, Mexico, uh, it can continue to feed us that information for years just getting its power from the sun. No, that was such a great observation. I didn't even see that, but yeah, you can see that little uh, solar panel on the backpack. Wow. All right, so I do just want to reiterate that there are just so many incredible conservation stories happening right here in our backyard in North America. I know that we might have some viewers actually visiting us from other countries as well. But I think that this is just a great example of that in order for one species, say the black-footed ferret to be successful in the wild, we really need to work and protect the entire habitat and the entire ecosystem because so many of these animals rely on each other. And again, just like that black-footed ferret was reintroduced, we are now working to reintroduce all of these other um, wonderful species to the Great American Plains. Um, quick question from Morgan about whether Andrew was showing us bones, if we saw bones out there quickly. Yeah, I, I did see that too, right at the entrance to the burrow. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew gave a thumbs up, but yes, that's what that was. Do you have any idea what animal that might have been from? You know, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think if I had to guess, I, I think it was probably the jaw of a prairie dog itself. Um, so, you know, that could have been an animal that, that died over the winter. Um, it could have been an animal that, that died because it was, you know, it was predated, it was eaten by a fox or a badger or something like that. But, you know, these, these prairie dogs are so, so, so numerous in these habitats that we do find bones pretty often. That's so great. Um, so I'm actually going to invite Adrian and Vicki back on if they are still here for our Q&A. But Dana and Andy, thank you very much. Let's get to some of these amazing questions. Um, Nora has a wonderful question for, perhaps we can ask all three of you about what did you study in school and how did you get to these careers? Adrian, why don't we start with you? Uh, for my undergraduate degree, I studied animal science, and then I went on and did my PhD in physiology with a focus on reproduction. So I have a lot of research um, going on with assisted breeding 
and ways to help our animals breed more efficiently uh, by natural means and just make more babies so we can re-release them. Very cool. And Vicki, if you are on, Vicki, what was your education path? I originally wanted to be a veterinarian um, as when people would go, oh, I want to work with animals. Mm -hmm. uh, after starting out with wildlife science at Virginia Tech, um, I actually had come to the Smithsonian for one of their open houses and talked to the vets and some of the animal keepers and stuff like that and had decided to change paths that I was more interested in the animal care side of things. So I finished out my degree at Virginia Tech in wildlife science. And then I just started doing a lot of volunteering and internships before being able to get an actual uh, permanent job here. Great. And Dana, what about you? Sure. Well, I'm still in school, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I started with getting a college degree from Kansas State, where I'm from in Kansas. So I've been in the prairie for a really long time and loving it for a long time. And then I got a master's degree at Purdue, learning how to model populations and how they change to different disturbances. And I worked in Wyoming for a few years with those population uh, measuring skills. I was able to get a job working on black-footed ferrets and prairie dogs. And then here I am getting to study swift foxes in Montana. I'm pretty lucky. Barbara had a quick shout out for Go Wildcats. I'm assuming that was a, one of your school mascots. It is. Go Cats. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy, what about you? Hey, yeah, I, I guess I had a little bit of a winding path. So I, I started college at, um, at Georgia Tech down in Atlanta. Uh, I wanted to be a, a biomedical engineer, but as it turned out, there just there wasn't enough animals and biology in that for me. So I transferred to the University of Colorado, got my bachelor's degree in ecology and evolution. Uh, after that, I spent a lot of time working as a, as a field technician, studying birds all over the world from Venezuela to Borneo to South Africa. Uh, and finally, I got my PhD at the University of Montana here in, here in Missoula, where I currently am. Um, and even though I was in Missoula, I was studying birds in the tropics, so uh, on the island of Borneo over in Southeast Asia. So after I finished up my PhD, uh, I was really excited that I got to, um, got to stay here in Montana and uh, do work trying to conserve the birds here close to home. Wow, that's really cool. So we have a couple questions about black-footed ferrets specifically. Adrian, can you tell us, are there other types of ferrets? Someone asked, are there other, are there white-footed ferrets or any other colors, different types of ferrets? Well, there's definitely domestic ferrets, um, which you might see in your pet store. Um, and some people do have them as, as pets. Um, Black-footed ferrets, however, do not make good pets. So please keep that in mind. Um, and then they're very closely related to other mustelids. So other animals like mink, um, something you may not think of, um, otters are also mustelids. So they're all basically from the same family. Wow, really cool. And a little uh, question about the differences between males and females. Are, is there a difference between that you can tell them apart? The males are usually a little bit bigger, but it's hard to tell them apart unless you are pretty close to them. Great. Um, and uh, let's see these questions here. Um, there was a question specifically for Dana. Matthew asked if you studied other animals in other countries. Um, you know, I not very much. I've mostly stuck close to home, but I did spend one fall studying shorebirds in Puerto Rico. So not another country, but definitely different than my prairie home. Very cool. Um, and Andy, this is a wonderful question. We referred to those uh, trackers on the long build curlew, like little backpacks. How do you attach them to the long build curlew? Yeah, so uh, those backpacks or those tags, uh, uh, what we call them, they're attached by a harness. So I guess the, the best way that I could describe it is it, it's a bit like a human climbing harness where, where the loops that, that attach to the tag itself go around the legs of the bird. Uh, and we do that on purpose because um, one other way to attach it would be to kind of put loops around the base of the wings. But these birds are migrants and, and you know, they have to fly sometimes thousands of miles down to their wintering grounds in, in Mexico and Texas. 
and we really want to have the most minimal minimal impact possible so don't like to put any sort of harnesses around the wings that's why we do the leg very cool and um it looks like vicky added more enrichment to this black-footed ferret vicky if you're still on can you tell us what you just put in that um habitat for her yeah this is another one of our females and so she just got um kind of similar to what the other female got is a uh we're repurposing an empty bag with some shredded paper and a little bit of rat scent to try to get her uh to investigate and explore a variety awesome. for her so for those of you uh that but maybe had trouble hearing. So she, just like we saw earlier, she put in one of those uh, recycled bags in there for this black-footed ferret to further explore um, and really exhibit her curiosities. That's great. Let's see other questions. Um, this is a great question coming from Miss Johnson's fourth grade class. Adrian, you mentioned that they sort of, the black-footed ferrets continue to be endangered on and off. Can you tell us why that happens? So we actually thought the population was completely lost to us. We thought that they were extinct. Um, and then we did find those 18 still in the wild. That was 40 years ago. So we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of finding that population in the wild. But the population fluctuates a lot. So they started reintroducing animals in the early 90s, and there certainly have been increases in the population and then periods of time when the population just hasn't done very well. Um, so there's definitely you know, um, highs and lows in the population numbers. So they definitely are still considered to be endangered. And we're still doing a lot of work to secure habitat for them and make sure they have that safe habitat, safe uh, prey base of the prairie dogs and make sure that those numbers stay robust. Very cool. And I have another question specifically. They're called Blackfoot of Ferrets. They have black feet. Do they have a purpose for having black feet? Is that, um, is that an adaptation in any way that you know of? Uh, that is a very good question. I'm not sure if, there, if there's a specific reason why they have um, black feet. Wondering maybe if it's the heat or the sand there or the warm ground or cooler ground. It's pretty warm out there in the summer on that on the sand. Uh, yes, whoever asked that will maybe have to become a black-footed ferret uh, researcher as well and let us know. That's so great. Let's see what other questions we have. Um, so there's a, another question about their favorite food. I think we determined that our black-footed ferrets love prairie dogs. It's a great question. <laughs> Um, how, what is the life expectancy of a black-footed ferret? Not a lot. In the wild, they usually live one to three years, but in zoos, they can live four to nine years. Four to nine years, wow. Great. Um, so just want to reiterate, there's a question about in here, and we touched on it a little bit, that we there are domesticated ferrets that are not black-footed ferrets. Can you just reiterate, um, Adrian, about keeping ferrets as pets? Yes, so black-footed ferrets are, they do not make very good pets. Um, so there are domestic ferrets that um, have been bred purposefully for the pet industry. And you may see those at your local pet store or pet co and, and places like that. Um, so all of our wild species, our endangered species, like the black-footed ferrets and a lot of the other species we have in our zoos, we, we want them to stay wild and stay in their natural habitats. Um, we, we keep them in our zoo facilities so that we can help them reproduce, increase their numbers, re-release them back into the wild, make sure that we have them in our zoos so everyone can learn about them and their natural habitats. But again, we, we do not want people to think that any of these animals, just because we have them in our zoos, we don't want you to think that they make good pets. Yes, that's a great point. If you're thinking about getting a pet, we always urge all of our viewers to do your research. Make sure that you can provide all of the proper and appropriate care to give um, those animals the best life. Um, so again, huge difference between our black-footed ferrets that we're seeing um, as well as the um, the ferrets that you might see in your local pet store. That's great. Um, OK, 
can we discuss a little bit about, Allison wants to know about their survival in hot weather. Are there any adaptations? And let's cover both the black-footed ferret um, and the swift fox. Do they have any special adaptations to help um, survive hot weather? Adrian, we can start with you. Oh, okay. Um, well, they are very light colored, um, which probably helps them adapt to the heat in the summer. Um, and they live down in those burrows. So it's pretty cool down there during the day in those prairie dog burrows. And so they're very active at night. Again, so we talked about them being nocturnal animals. So most of their activity is going on at night when the temperatures are much cooler. Very, very cool. What about those swift foxes, Dana? I would say it's a pretty similar answer. They're taking advantage of those burrow systems or for swift foxes, we call them dens. And, you know, once you get deep down into those burrows, it stays at a nice 55 degrees or so year round. So it ends up being a refuge for them in hot weather and in cold weather. Absolutely. So again, just how important those prairie dog burrows are to the entire ecosystem. They provide such a relief for all of these animals, especially in that warm weather. Oh, this is a great note. Barbara says that Frontier Airlines has an airplane with a black-footed ferret on its tail named Wellington. I had no idea. Did you all know that? <laughs> no, but Wellington is a town very close to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Ferret Conservation Center. Wow, that's really, really cool. All right, we are approaching four minutes till the end and there's a great question that I would love each of you to answer. Um, Bill has asked, why do we need to care about these animals? Um, let's start with Adrian. Okay, so all of the animals that we have in our zoos and conservation facilities, they're all here because they need assistance to either help increase their populations or help with their genetic diversity um, or just to understand their basic biology. So all of the animals in these ecosystems are critical to, to maintain that ecosystem. And so we try to have representatives from lots of different ecosystems so that folks can understand that each one has its own special place and it's a balance of all of the species in that ecosystem. And they all play a really special role in keeping the, the natural habitat's healthy. That's great. Dana, what about you? That was a great answer, Adrian. And I would probably just echo that, you know, each of these species plays a role in its system. To be honest, we could study them for our entire lives and people have been, and we still don't have all the answers for how they're interconnected and how they really facilitate all the other species. So each one is very valuable. That's great. And Andy? Yeah, the, both of those answers were, were just totally right on. Um, and I, I, I would speak to, I guess, prairie dog conservation in, in, in particular here a little bit. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of animals in the prairie, like swift foxes, bison, black-footed ferrets that are, um, I guess we would call charismatic megafauna, right? It, it's easy to sort of fall in love with these animals, get to see their behaviors. It's very cool. But, you know, prairie dogs, it's, you know, Kind of like the the eat your vegetables portion of conservation of prairie landscapes right a lot of times these animals are, are underappreciated um, but they really form the foundation of an entire prairie ecosystem which is why they're really really important for us to conserve that's so great um, so I just want to wrap up here again today is Earth Day and here at the Smithsonian we do celebrate Earth optimism and this is why we love telling the story so much it's not just about the importance of zoos and organizations that are breeding these endangered or almost extinct animals for these reintroduction pro um, projects but it's also just so important to take care of all of the species the entire habitat and the entire ecosystem as well. Um, so again, I am going to launch one final poll here. I want to know from all of you what you will do to help save species. Uh, again, this is a multiple choice, recycle paper, you can turn off the lights, <laughs> excuse me, turn off the water when brushing your teeth, unplug your appliances when they're not being used, bringing reusable bags to the store, and even just telling your friends and family about this awesome conservation story about the black-footed ferrets. 
Um, additionally, we would love your feedback on this webinar so that we can continue to learn and grow. So a short survey will open in your browser following the end of this webinar, or it will be um, put in the chat as well from one of our educators. I again want to thank Adrian and Vicki, Andy, Dana, Andrew, and Josh, as well as El and uh, Claire, who were our interpreter and captioner. Um, and thank you again for joining us for this very special Earth Optimism webinar exploring the conservation success of the Black-Footed Ferret and the American Prairie. Uh, we do have two additional webinars to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day next month. On May 5th at 11 a.m., we'll have a live bird banding uh, program with ecologist Brian Evans. And then on May 7th at 1 p.m., we'll have a, our next Wild Side of STEAM career webinar with avian ecologist Ruth Bennett. And both of those will be on our website, and you'll uh, be able to follow that link in the chat. So on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, thanks for tuning in, and we hope you have a wild day. Bye.